Thanks very much, and thank you for inviting me along. <clears throat> so as you mentioned, my name is Roy. I work for Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service. I'm based at Yeovil in our group support team up there, actually working from home in Castle Carey at the minute. <clears throat> that little place you probably go through on the train going to London. And I said, I work at the Yeovil group support team. I've been in the job about 44 years now, um, covered all aspects of fire service work, but predominantly fire safety. And again, within fire safety, I've been involved with enforcement um, action, uh, prohibition action, and including events, sort of, um, so we say, uh, trying to get the message across to um, organisations like yourself. So what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to talk about um, fire risk assessment process. Yes, you need to do a fire risk assessment. We'll talk about your responsibilities under fire safety legislation. And yes, you do have some. We'll talk about the management of yeah. fire safety. Say hello to um, them. Hello. Management, management is the key bit with fire safety. And we will go a bit deeper on that later on. We'll talk about specific concerns that I've noticed going around village halls. Yeah. Um, you don't have to do it, do you? 44 mute. years. We've got somebody going on mute, yeah. <clears throat> I say 44 years, um, I've been to quite a few village halls, mainly within Somerset. Um, I've picked up lots of recurring questions. I've sort of made a note of those and we'll go a bit deeper on those recurring questions um, later on today. You just interact like thumbs up and stuff. We'll talk about our approach to uh, inspecting premises and we'll also talk about supporting information yeah. available free of charge on the net. Lots and lots of supporting information what we talk about today, all the information is available free of charge um, on the net with various documents. The problem is trying to find it. So I'm going to split it into two, two halves, basically. The first half, we'll talk about risk assessments, the risk assessment process. We'll have a break and then we'll talk about the other topics in the second half. The event we've done in Somerset lasted about two hours. Well, like I can't see every face going for two hours. <clears throat> At least you can blank out and walk off. I've got to stay here. <laughs> Okie doke. <clears throat> so the talk is based primarily on the guide, freely available guide, small and medium places of assembly. This document can you, is can you repeat that, please? Can you repeat yeah. that? <clears throat> it's just we'll send you a link to this anyway. Okay. But it's, the fire risk assessment uh, guide, small and medium places of assembly. But we will send you a link to this freely available document. And on top of that, it's also based on this document, which uh, comes from your own organisation. Really informative. <clears throat> if you haven't seen it, have a look through. Again, really informative. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, the link to the guide will be forwarded to you at the end of this talk. <clears throat> It'll be forwarded to you by Martin, um, along with contact details for our help desk and other supporting information available on the net. The information we're going to talk about today is going to be pretty generic. It won't be specific to your community hall or village hall because all halls are different. Yes, yeah, some are small, some are big. We've got some new ones. We've got some old ones. We may have some with rooms upstairs. The so all halls are going to be different, the layout, etc. So the information is going to be generic and not necessarily specific to your hall, but you can soon relate it to your hall, if you get what I mean. If you're lucky enough to have a new hall, that hall is going to be built to the latest building regulations standard. All right, so you're basically almost there. A few other things you need to do, but for the design and layout of the building, you're basically there. So historically, certainly in Somerset, we used to visit uh, premises every two or three years. We'd tell you what to do. Get that emergency lighting checked. Those extinguishers need sorting. Um, that changed. Legislation changed in 2006 along with our inspection strategy. The legislation, the regulatory reform, fire safety order 2005. It sounds a bit of a handful but it brought all fire safety legislation under one umbrella. At that time, our inspection strategy changed more to a risk 
evidence-based approach, and we stopped visiting village halls on a regular basis. Now, this legislation, it gives us powers to inspect and enforce. So we've got the powers to come along to your village hall, carry out an inspection and enforce measures if deemed necessary. It also places a duty on a responsible person to put measures in place to protect relevant persons. Hmm. Okay. A responsible person, ultimately, <clears throat> any premises, somebody is responsible. <clears throat> right? There's somebody at the top of the tree that is ultimately responsible if things go pear shaped. A relevant person, somebody legally on the premises. All right, so anybody attending an event. Now the village hall management committee are deemed as responsible persons. So as a member of the uh, management committee, maybe you're a chair, I don't know, but um, between you, with your committee, you are deemed as a responsible person and you do have a duty to put measures in place to protect people from fire. So the key requir requirement for that responsible person is to appoint a competent person, somebody with a bit of knowledge and know-how on fire safety, to carry out a fire risk assessment. Right, and that's the key requirement, is to carry out that fire risk assessment. Again, all the information in here, this is in two parts. The first part goes through um, how to carry out the risk assessment, and the second part is a bit more in depth. It might sound scary, and it's easy for me to say it's not. It can be really basic, especially for a small village hall. That risk assessment can be really basic and it's designed that you can do it yourselves. Is what I will say with your risk assessment, <clears throat> the greater the risk, the more in depth we expect the fire risk assessment to be. So if you've got a small village hall, it's one room, doors at the front and the back. Um, the risk assessment is going to be pretty basic. If we've got a village hall and we've got lots of rooms, we've got upstairs area, maybe we have sleeping on the premises, your risk assessment is going to be more in depth. Your risk assessment is proportional to risk <clears throat> and it doesn't need to be too complicated. If you feel, <clears throat> excuse me, if you feel you're not competent in doing your risk assessment, yes, you can get an outside uh, contractor to do it for you. Quite often it's retired fire officers. Um, quite often it may, or it may well be somebody who's decided to set up in business as a fire risk assessor. If you're gonna do that, check their credentials, get two or three quotes. Uh, if you are gonna get somebody outside to do it, there are cost implications. And that uh, risk assessor will come along, he'll do your risk assessment for you, he'll provide you with a report. That is the start. Is what that risk assessor will do is list the significant findings. The significant findings in Fire Brigade speak are the things that need addressing to make sure your premises are safe from fire. So if you've had a risk assessment, it's been done by an outside person, he's given you that big document, charged you a couple hundred quid for it, um, that is only the start. Please make sure you have a look at it, read it, have a look at the significant findings, which will probably be in the back somewhere, <clears throat> and that will list the things that need doing to make the premises safe. So the aims of the fire risk assessment, <clears throat> the aims of the risk assessment are to identify fire hazards, to reduce the risk of those hazards causing harm to as low as level as possible, and to decide what physical measures and management procedures need to be put in place and are necessary to ensure the safety of people that will be using the premises. So we're identifying the hazards, reducing the risk and putting measures in place to protect people. You've probably heard about the five step approach to risk assessments. Um, <clears throat> in health and safety circles, yeah, it's sort of a, the five step approach is right across the board. We take that same approach with fire risk assessments. Step one, we're identifying the fire hazards. We're looking at areas um, within your village hall 
um, where a fire could occur. And you're probably thinking going around your village hall now, um, candles, hopefully not, um, candles, uh, electrics, cooking, heating, um, maybe smoking area. It's areas where there's a pretty good chance if you're going to have a fire, that is where it's going to start. So we're looking at those areas. Once we've identified those areas, um, we're going to look at what can burn within those areas. So we could have a, a candle, if you like, not that we want candles, and we certainly don't want candles, but if you've got a candle in a room with a concrete floor, um, stuck in the middle of the floor, there's not much chance of anything burning. Um, <clears throat> but if we've got materials around it that could burn, we're looking at stage scenery, banners, decorations, exercise mats, um, anything that can burn within that area, We've got the two together, we're going to have a problem. All right, so we're looking at causes of fire, things that could start a fire, the electrics, the cooking, the heating, and trying to isolate those things from items that can burn. Exercise mats, stage scenery, for example. So we've identified the hazards, we know what can burn, we're now looking at the people that are at risk. In a community hall environment, we're going to get lots of different groups of people at risk. It's not like an office where you've got one lot of people and those people stay constant, if you like, with the risk they provide. In a village hall environment, we're having lots of different groups that come in. Um, we've got the caretakers and the cleaners, for example, to start with, working on their own, maybe. Children. Um, if you have a play group, um, the need to protect those children from fire are going to be different to the needs needed to protect a different group, a wedding party or whatever, for example. So we've got children, we've got lone people working. Um, we talk about parties, wedding parties, 18th birthday parties, um, maybe, oh, that's what we have. Uh, we can have groups using it on a continuous nature. So we've got different types of groups. Um, the wedding party would be a one-off group. Um, maybe it's a regular meeting, a play group, indoor bowls or whatever. Each of those groups are going to have a different approach to um, getting people out in the event of fire. And you need to consider those different groups. Let's give you an example of a play group. We've got young children under five. Um, we don't really want the exit doors readily available to fling open and we're going to have children wandering about outside, especially if it's going out onto the road. So the measures put in place there to protect the children will be different to perhaps an indoor bowls club, a movieola night or something like that. So when considering these groups, um, we need to ensure that your um, concerns and observations in respect to your risk assessment are passed to them. If we've got an event and the committee members are there, present, okay, those committee members will have some degree of control and know the layout of the building. But if we've got a group that are coming, let's go back to the 18th birthday party, um, a total outside group coming in to use the premises, somebody needs to be responsible for that group. And you need to ensure that your concerns are passed to that group. As are your concerns with your fire risk assessment? And they need to do their own risk assessment to address their particular needs. All right, so you've done your risk assessment for the hall. If you have an outside group coming in to use the hall, especially if there's no committee members present, then that outside group will need to conduct their own risk assessment to address their own particular needs. Let's go back to the play group. And I've done work with a play group and obviously they don't want doors, push bar doors, slinging open and the young people escaping, for want of a better word. We had um, a chat with the play group and their risk assessment, their measures they put in place, they had a real basic lock on those doors. All right. When the fire alarm went off, they practice it um, regularly, fire drills, etc. 
when the fire alarm goes off and they have a drill or whatever, uh, the children line up, oh. a member of staff at the front of the queue, Sally. a member of staff at the end, the member of staff at the front would release the door lock, open the doors, and the children would es escape, leave the building in a controlled manner. In that instance, it was addressed in a risk assessment. That's why it's great. And I accepted some sort of securing device on the door. Do you ask everyone to mute. I keep hearing a dog barking. It's most off-putting. Could you do that, please? <clears throat> right. Okay, so um, I have a quick... Yeah. <laughs> Edwina, if you could mute, please. Um, Roger, if you could mute. Rick. Yeah, he has to mute. I am muted. I was muted. What's happened to it? <coughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs> Good. Who else? Okay. Maurice, if you could mute as well, please. And Rowena. Oh, Rowena, we've got you muted. Yeah, that's good. Okay, Roger. Thanks for that. Okie dokie. Yeah, I was picking up the occasional dog bark and I was thinking, that's not me. Um, Okie dokie. So we talked about your risk assessments and um, yes, you need to do that risk assessment. And outside groups using your premises, they need to do their own risk assessment to complement the measures you have in place. Step three, step three, evaluate, remove, reduce and protect. Hmm, that's four steps within itself. Okay. Step three, we've identified the hazards in step one. We've looked at the people at risk in step two. Now step three, we need to put measures in place. We need to do something about it. There's no point um, going around thinking, oh, and get a fire there one day when we've gone around it. step one looking at hazards etc cardboard boxes in the boiler room um that's going to cause problems to the people that use the hall uh, we've looked at hazard we now need to do something about it ideally remove the hazard so if it's cardboard boxes in the boiler room we'd expect them to be removed if it's portable heaters we expect something to be done about the fact that they're portable, i.e. fix them to a wall. If it's candles that are used, um, <clears throat> we expect measures to be in place, you can remove the risk, you can ban candles. Right? You're in charge of your hall. If for whatever reason people want to use candles, um, you can put measures in place and ban the use of them. And we don't like being killed joys, but candles are a problem. And I've actually seen, I went to a wedding ceremony uh, where candles were on the, uh, the table for the ambience. And there was two separate fires where the candles caught light to serviettes and things. Only little incidents, but when you get that with alcohol involved, you're going to have problems, believe me. So we can remove the risk. Brilliant, ideal. Or we can reduce the risk. Um, talk about heaters. So if you've got portable heaters, we expect them to be fixed back against the wall uh, with guards as necessary. If it's electrics, and electrics do cause a lot of fires, um, we expect the electrics to be tested. Um, we can't insist on PAT testing, but that is one way of um, checking that electrics okay, portable appliance testing. Uh, um, that can be done on a annual five yearly basis down to yourself um, with the equipment you've got and how it's used but that's not to stop you going around perhaps on a six monthly basis three monthly basis checking the leads on kettles for example just making sure you've got no loose wires no cables have been put on hot plates and melted through that sort of thing or maybe cables have been pinched indoors because that's where you're going to get a fire that's going to cause a problem so pat testing with electrics, um, we can reduce the risk. Um, foam mats, for example, we'd expect them to be kept in a locked store. Right. Foam, it will burn. Once it gets going, it takes some putting out real thick black smoke. Uh, when not in use, we expect them to be locked away, away from um, combustible sources. 
So we've evaluated the risk. Uh, we've removed any potential problems or reduced it to as low as level as possible. But there are still a chance, there is still a chance that a fire may occur. And we need to put measures in place to ensure that people can escape safely in the event of a fire. Let's start with detecting a fire. How do we detect the fire? Maybe in your hall, you have automatic fire detection, smoke detectors, a bit more advanced than what you've got in your home, hopefully, um, but a series of linked smoke detectors within your hall uh, that activate and ring a bell, basically, when they go off. It may be a person that detects the fire. In most village halls, the fire is detected by a person. Right? No problem with that at all um, in a small village hall. If it's a larger village hall, you have an upstairs area, then perhaps we need to look a bit deeper. But if it's a person, uh, I'm quite happy with that and I can accept that. So we've detected the fire. How are we going to raise the alarm? Again, if you've got those automatic uh, smoke detectors, um, they're going to activate and they're going to emit a sound warning you that there is a fire. If it's a person that raises the alarm, it may be you've got um, break glass call points by the doors. Break the glass, bells ring, people hear the bell, they escape from the building. It may be that when you raise the alarm, somebody shouts fire. I'm happy with that. I can accept that in a small premises. All right. If you've got a, quite a large hall and you were to stand perhaps in the entrance foyer and shout fire, if it's a small hall, you're going to hear that shout of fire. If it's quite a large hall with meeting rooms off further down the corridor or whatever, there's a pretty good chance you won't hear that shout of fire. And so in that instance, that wouldn't be acceptable. But in a small village hall, a shout of fire, yes, we can accept. We can accept gongs. We can accept whistles, rotary gongs, whatever. All right. If you've got measures in place to raise the alarm, it doesn't matter what measures you've got in place. The key thing is ensuring that the other hall users know what the alarm sound is. There's no real point in you having a system set up right when there's a fire we'll blow a whistle we've got whistles strategically placed around the hall if heaven forbid there's a fire and somebody blows that whistle everybody who's using the hall just hasn't got a clue what it's all about all right so I mean, yes whistles gongs we're happy with but they need to be managed and the fact that we blow a whistle when there is a fire needs to be relayed to the hall users We've raised the alarm. We now need to look at getting out of the hall safely. Ideally, we'll turn our back on the fire and walk away. Occasionally, there'll be instances where you've got a room with a single door where perhaps that might not be possible. But ideally, and certainly in the public areas, we'd expect you to be able to turn your back on the fire and walk away to safety. We expect exit routes to be protected where necessary. So, for example, with a kitchen, you may have a fire door on your kitchen. You may have a um, fire resisting shutter that drops down. I don't know. Um, they're there for a reason. They're there to stop the fire spreading from a high risk area, the kitchen, right, to the main area. And they're there to protect the escape route for other hall users to give them time to escape safely from the building. So exit routes protected, exit doors must be readily available. I know we talked about the play group and the play group where they put a, a small lock or some securing device on the door, that is managed. In normal circumstances, we expect doors to be readily available. Ideally, push bar doors, it can be just a handle that you turn and open. It depends on the size of the hall and the number of people using it. All right. Normal village hall, I'd expect um, push bar doors and you push 
open outwards in the direction of travel and I'd expect them front and back. We'll touch a little bit more on that later on. Um, how many can you have in your hall? We're going to cover that later. Uh, occupancy ratings, occupancy ratings, fire brigade speak. How many people can you have in your hall? Exit routes we expect to be clear, both inside and out. So if your exit route is down a corridor, maybe we don't expect to see it um, obstructed by chairs, tables, cardboard boxes. We expect it to be clear. And once we open those double doors, we expect that escape route, that whether it's a four foot, let's say it's a four foot escape route, a double door escape route, that same width all the way around to the pavement. Right? We don't want to be opening double doors and then find we go into a smaller yard type area with a small single door leading us out to the pavement. Right? We need that ex exit width to be maintained. Talking about yards, etc. Um, if your escape route goes out into an enclosed yard, then that is not acceptable. Right? We need to ensure that people can get out through the doors. Whether it goes into a yard, they then need to be able to get around, basically around to the front of the building, to the road. Right? We cannot accept them going into an enclosed yard where they're basically going to be trapped. So we talked about getting out safely. Um, emergency lighting. Yes, you've got emergency lighting in your hall. Um, it directs you towards the exit. Um, maybe you've got emergency lighting outside. I don't know. If your hall's in the middle of town, it may not be necessary. You've got street lights and outside lighting. If you're uh, out in the sticks and don't have street lights or anything like that, and 11 o'clock at night, the outside of your hall is pretty pitch black then you need to consider emergency lighting outside of the premises to lead people round to the front of the building to a safe area, the car park or wherever. Getting people out safely, signage. You know the layout of your hall. Other people that come along to use it won't know the layout. For that reason, we expect exit signs above the door, and ideally nearby to the emergency lighting, the lighting comes on, um, the sign is there, it's directing you, it's pulling you towards the exit, towards safety. Signage on push bar doors, we expect a sign, push bar to open. Seems pretty obvious to you, and certainly to me it does, but to somebody unfamiliar with the building or unfamiliar with those types of doors, they may think, what do we do here? Push bars to open signs. And we'd also expect um, fire action signs. So actions to take in the event of fire. Extinguishers. Yes, we'd expect fire extinguishers within your hall. Um, they need to be appropriate to risk. Uh, we'll talk about numbers of extinguishers later on. Um, a normal sized hall, probably a minimum of two extinguishers and then additional extinguishers for specific risks. Boilers, for example, um, kitchens, um, maybe you've got a computer suite, we'd expect additional extinguishers to cover those risks. Again, keeping people safe, um, we'd expect a testing and maintenance procedure to be set up. If you've got the emergency lighting, it needs to be checked once a month. It needs to be checked once a month by just an occasional flick of the switch to ensure that the bulb works. Once a month, you're checking the bulb. Now, there are two ways of doing it. Um, you can isolate the electrical circuit at the mains. Um, most emergency lighting units these days have got um, like a separate fishtail type switch, pretty close by. Um, there's a picture of that in this guide. Um, basically a little fishtail type switch that you can put in and isolate the supply of electric going to the emergency lighting unit. The emergency lighting unit you've got is trickle charged. It's continually trickle charged from the lighting circuit. I keep mentioning the lighting circuit. 
it's important it's wired into the lighting circuit um, because let's say it's wired into the mains, the ordinary ring main, and that ring main um, fails, the lighting, or let's say the lighting circuit fails and the ring main's still active, it's not going to come on. So it must be into the lighting circuit. So this switch, um, basically when you flick it, you're isolating the trickle charge supply to the lighting unit. That unit has got a battery which will last probably up to three hours. And as soon as the trickle charge stops, it activates the switch, it comes on. Monthly, you're checking the bulb. Annually, you're checking the duration of the batteries. So once a year, you're putting the lights on and you're leaving it on just to ensure that it will stay on for an hour, two hours, whatever it's designed to stay on for. Fire alarm. If you have uh, break glass call points, etc., we expect them to be checked once a week. Smoke detectors, etc., um, checked by a competent uh, engineer, if you like, on a six monthly and annually. <clears throat> Fire extinguishers, annually, like by a competent person. Again, you can have your own plans in place where you go around and do a visual check, whether it's once a month, once a week, or whatever but um, certainly checked annually by a competent person. And finally, we need procedures in place to call the Fire and Rescue Service. Us. Yes, you know how to call us. You know where the hall is. You know the full address, probably the postcode as well. Somebody using your hall for the first time, I guess they know what village or town they're in, but the street the exact location of the hall, the postcode, they will not know where it is. So it's important that those details are on display and readily available for other hall users to see. Now we're looking, yes, postcode, and more recently, uh, what free words. Um, what free words is an app freely available and basically, the, I think it's the whole world is split up into three meter squares. Each of those three meter squares is given three separate, totally obscure words. If you sign into the app, um, you can pinpoint the entrance to your village hall, the three meter square in front of your village hall, and it will tell you or give you three separate obscure words. If those are available by the postcode, if somebody calls us and tells us those three words, we can pinpoint exactly where you are. For example, I'm in Castle Carey, and the what three words for Castle Carey Fire Station is minivans, worker, spot. Totally obscure, three different words. And if I was to move to the next three meter square at Castle Carey Fire Station, it would be three totally different words. Right. What three words is worth considering and have them by your address? Step four. Step four of your fire risk assessment. Again, it's broken down to three little bits. Record, plan and train. If you employ four people or less, you don't need to record your fire risk assessment. The risk assessment process is not just for village halls, it's right across the board where basically where members of the public may be, shops, businesses, factories, factories, whatever. Four people or less, you don't need to record it. But if your premises are licensed, and I'm guessing they are, you do need to record it. Right. That said, if you don't employ anybody, you don't have a license, and you're thinking, hey, I've got away with this. Um, I'd strongly recommend that you do record it as an audit trail, um, just to prove that uh, if, if things do go wrong, do go pear-shaped, you've done more than you need to do to make the premises safe. Right, it's covering your back, basically. Um, I'd recommend you record your risk assessment, even if you don't have to. But if you're licensed, you do. So you're recording it. Um, 
all you're doing, you don't need to record. And um, I've seen if you're paying for one massive documents, if I'm charging you 500 quid for a risk assessment, I've got to justify it. Am I really? Big document. Um, is all you need to record are the significant findings, the things that need doing. So if you're going around your hall with a clipboard, you're looking and think, kitchen, that's all okay. And electrics, looking a bit dodgy. When were they last tested? Well, they haven't been tested since we bought them. Maybe we ought to set up a testing regime. Record it. The electrics need to be tested. We move on a bit further. Exit routes, yeah, they're readily available. Extinguishers, all okay. We can tick to say it's okay if you like. But the only thing that you need to record is the fact that the electrics need to be tested. So we've recorded the fact the electrics need to be tested. We then need to record what we've done about it. Right, we've got an electrician to come in and check all our electrics. And then it's good practice to record what measures you've put in place to protect for the future. We've got the electrician to come back on a five yearly contract to check all our electrics. Right. Done. But you only need to record what needs doing to make the premises safe. Plan. It's important you've got a clear plan in place to um, ensure that people in the building are kept safe from fire. Um, your plan is going to be a little bit more, your fire plan's a little bit more than raise the alarm, get out, stay out, call the fire brigade. Um, <clears throat> your fire plan will perhaps include um, testing regimes, um, who's responsible for what, who's responsible for calling the fire and rescue service if there is a fire, who's responsible for meeting the fire and rescue service. Um, it's a little bit more in depth. Again, there's a few pages in this book specifically about plans, right, fire plans, but you need to have that plan in place. Training. You need to do a certain amount of training. It doesn't have to be really in-depth, in-depth. If you want to put all committee members on fire extinguisher training courses, I wouldn't stop you from doing that. But if you told me that um, we've had basic training on how to use extinguishers, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy I could accept that in the village hall community. Um, but you do need basic training. So the person responsible for the hall, whether it's a committee member for a specific event or whether it's an outside organisation, a play group or whatever, they must have some sort of training on what to do if there is a fire. Raising the alarm. We talked about whistles. Um, so people need to be trained, basically, that in the event of fire, blow the whistle. We also need to train the users of the hall that in the event of fire, you'll hear a whistle. And when you hear the whistle, evacuate the building. Right. Really basic, but you do need some sort of training. It can be really, really basic, but you do need some sort of training. Step five, review. Your risk assessment needs to be reviewed. And um, there's no laid down time scale. Um, annually is not a bad um, sort of uh, starting figure, if you like. But if circumstances change within your hall, then you need to review your risk assessment straight away. And we're looking at alterations. Maybe you've carried out some alterations. You've decided to block up a door that's never used without realizing it. Hey, that door is there for a specific reason. It's there to escape in the event of fire. You need to sort of review your risk assessment. Um, groups coming in. Um, so if you've got a play group coming in uh, for the first time, your risk assessment needs to be reviewed and their risk assessment needs to be specific and the two risk assessments need to work together. Um, other groups coming in, different groups, maybe it's a bowls group, um, people with mobility issues or whatever, then the risk assessment needs to be reviewed each time to address those concerns. Sleeping. If you have sleeping within your premises, and we'll go a bit deeper on this later. <clears throat> you must review your risk assessment before that sleeping takes place. 
sleeping we're looking at probably local scout group local guides or whatever and um, they're using the uh, the village hall for a sleepover um, you must put additional measures in place to ensure their safety there's no point having a procedure when if there's a fire we're going to blow a whistle at three o'clock in the morning when everybody in the building's asleep nobody's going to see that there's a fire nobody's going to blow that whistle all right but sleeping in your premises, we'd expect and would insist on some sort of automatic fire detection, smoke detectors. All right. So if you've got sleeping on your premises for perhaps the first time, you need to review your fire risk assessment before that sleeping takes place. Oh, I've rattled on for 45 minutes. Are there any questions? That's briefly covered the risk assessment process. The plan is we'll have a break in a minute, uh, but if there's any questions, we can do the questions first, and then we'll stop for a cup of tea or whatever, and come back and do the, uh, the remainder of the presentation. Right, uh, okay, so um, if you can stick a hand up, I'm gonna have to toggle between two screens, so if you think I'm ignoring you, then, then butt in, but um, right, David Whitten, you've got to have a hand up there up in the spot. Or is that me? Yes. Yeah, me. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of groups um, come in, um, maybe one-off uh, events. How do you deal with that in terms of risk assessments? Um, okay, so let's say you've got um, an 18th birthday party, a one-off event. You've got your risk assessment done. Um, when the person comes and somebody is responsible, so somebody's gonna come and sign a bit of paper, <clears throat> I'd expect in your um, registration or handover documents or whatever, uh, when they sign up to hire the hall, that there'll be some sort of um, instruction detailing what that hire's responsibilities are. Um, I can't tell you what you're gonna put in there, but I would expect in respect of fire uh, for them to Yes, be aware of your fire risk assessment and the measures you've got in place to uh, protect people from fire. And if necessary, for them to put additional measures in. And that's down to them to uh, address. So it's basically in part of your registration documents. I'd expect something there. Yes, it's all about, I suppose, in this day and age, covering your back. Um, it's you providing an audit trial. If something does go wrong, um, you've done everything possible that you can do. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Alan Hamilton, you've got, you've got a hand up there. Okay. Thanks, um, Martin. Thanks, Roy. Um, a quick question on we, what seems to be a grey area for me is you said turn your back on the fire and leave but then we train people in extinguishers and use of where's where is that line between what we should and shouldn't do oh what a good question we'll go on to extinguishers later on but we will touch on it now um <clears throat> i would never make an extinguisher salesman because i would tell you to turn your back on the fire get out shut the door and call us out extinguishers and this has been challenged in the commercial world. Um, what was the one place I was, it was a resident, it wasn't a residential a care home, it was a sheltered housing where it was challenged and they actually didn't have extinguishers. And there was all sorts of things bouncing backs and forwards. In the village hall situation, yes, you must have extinguishers in place. You've got extinguishers in place, and even in a works uh, scenario, um, we can't insist that you use those extinguishers. All right, so um, you work in a factory, for example, we'll say, um, yes, your employer must put extinguishers in position to be used in the event of fire, but they can't insist that you put yourself at risk and use them. 
So in a village hall situation, if you've got committee members there, I'd expect, expect perhaps that the committee members have had a rough overview of how to use extinguishers, all right, training. Um, all extinguishers have on them instructions on how to use them, how not to use them, what you can use them on, and what not to use them on. Um, so yes, extinguishers have got to be there, but we can't insist you use them. Um, yeah, and there's a real catch-22 sort of situation. Um, if somebody feels competent in using the extinguishers, yes, they're there to be used. But with general members of the public, I'd expect those members of the public to turn the back on the fire, walk away, and shut the door. So it's down, it's down to choice. It, it is down to choice, yeah. We can't insist people use the extinguishers, but they do need to be there. And this debate has been going on for quite a time. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Right, David Whitten, you've got a hand up. Hi there. Uh, Roy, could you tell me when, you mentioned push doors briefly. Could you tell me when you need to fit a double push door rather than a single one? So um, a yes, one it's down to numbers. Um, probably easier, we're going to cover that in the second half. Okay. It's basically down to numbers of people using the building. Uh, inward opening doors, outward opening doors, um, both are acceptable, but um, they restrict or increase the number of people that can use the buildings. So if you're happy, I'll cover that in the second half. Yeah, that's fine. I'll listen out for it. Thank you. Um, Regan. Hello, yes, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, okay. yeah. Yes, yeah, good, yeah. Um, I've got a question about outside lighting because our hall is in a, a very dark rural area and at the moment all we have outside is a very unsuitable LED floodlight which blinds drivers, annoys neighbours and it's not much use at all. So we're looking at replacing that um, from a general um, safety and usefulness point of view. Um, can you recommend anything um from in terms of fire safety and people assembling outside when we come to replacing that light um and also i'm not aware that there's any outside lighting that comes on when the emergency lights come on in the case of a power cut so yeah we've got two side two types of lighting in use here so the the one that's glaring the drivers etc i'm guessing that's a general sort of security light like a street light outside which comes on all the time, stays on basically, controlled by a switch. Um, now, if the electric was to fail because of a fire or whatever, that light would go out because it's off the main lighting circuit. Um, is what you do need to consider um, is emergency lighting. Now, the emergency lighting, as we said, comes on when the electric fails. Um, so in what you've described to me, I'd perhaps expect, so there's no street lights or anything like that? No, not nearby. It's very, very yeah. dark in the car park. So it's going to be really, really dark. Yeah, pitch black. Um, so I'm guessing your um, uh, assembly point is going to be the car park? Not that I know where it's, the car park is. It is the, the car park, yeah. Um, but that wouldn't be lit normally at all. So I'd expect, because um, we want to get people away from the building. So let's say the door is at the back of the building, and I'm guessing there's an emergency lighting unit above the door to draw people to those doors. Once those people get outside, so if you look at it 11 o'clock tonight, for example, you think, hey, uh, this is totally dark. We really need some lights perhaps on that corner, um, along that walkway there. So maybe two or three um, emergency lighting units, which are identical to the ones above the door. All right, so they're wired into the lighting circuit. Um, they're continually trickle charged. And you can tell if they're emergency lighting because they've probably got a little LED green light or a red light built into them. So um, that will stay trickle charged as and when. And when they're needed, when the electric fails, they'll come on and they'll light that pathway around the outside of the building towards the assembly point. Okay. Right. 
Any more questions? I've got a hand up from Diana May. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. I've got a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if you will be covering it in the second part, but um, we've got quite a big hall. Um, we have emergency exits going out of the main hall, and then we have some corridors going out to some further doors um, the other side. What my question is, we have a balance in our hall, whether we leave cleaning products out for people and they trip over them because they're just put up against the wall, or whether I can put a metal cupboard on that emergency exit, so long as it doesn't encroach on the width of the doors. Is that allowed? Um, this is gonna be a real fire service get out answer. Um, <laughs> it, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <clears throat> um, if it's a corridor and down the end of the corridor, <clears throat> you've got double doors. So the corridor width is the same as the doors down the end and it's used for people to escape. Right. Then no, I wouldn't no. expect a cupboard. But you say the cupboard could perhaps be set back and not encroaching on the width. Yeah, the double doors open and then it goes into a bigger area. And yeah, then, yeah. then we've got the same width double doors on the other side. But I have got, you know, a sizable chunk of wall that I wouldn't encroach on the width of the outside doors. So it's a metal cupboard. <clears throat> it could Did be. I haven't bought one. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be kept locked. Well, <clears throat> yes, I could give users a um, the, th the thing is that our users clean the hall after they've used it. At the moment, things are left around, which actually I think is, is quite dangerous on the escape route because mm. they're not put away. So if I could put a hoover in there and the mop and bucket and lock the doors so that the users can get into that cupboard, but at least it's tidy. I would probably be happy with that, especially if it's a locked cupboard. OK, thank you. Um, with cl cleaning materials, especially this day and age, a lot of them are water based. So the risk yeah, we don't. Course. I mean, we don't give them <laughs> anything that could be hazardous to children anyway, because they would be lying around. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would plan to put something that was water based and non solvent, maybe in the top just to clean the floor. But it would be very minimal cleaning products. It's really just the physical things. And yeah, I'm sure in your risk assessment, you could justify having that locked cupboard there. I could. And with um, <laughs> real basic cleaning materials, and yeah. I'm probably happy. But I can't say definite yes or no because you I have. You can't yeah. see it, no. But yeah. I, it wouldn't encroach okay. on the walkway. And it is the second one. We've got a main foyer that it wouldn't be in, and this the second foyer from the other set of double doors because we have loads of doors, and then mm. we have another two double doors going out the other side of the hall anyway. So. No. Um, yeah, that sounds pretty feasible to me. OK, I can risk assess that. The other question, which you may actually be touching on, is stage curtains. And I, I, I can lie awake at night thinking about the stage curtains and um, whether we really need to do something about them. We've got quite a big stage. We'll talk about curtains in the second half. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. OK, anybody else? Shout out. Oh, no. Nope. Oh, good. And, okay. Right. Uh, so, sorry to just thinking, Martin. Yep. Um, Roy, we yeah. have, a, and Martin is familiar with our car park in Ted Burns, St. Mary. Our assembly point is at the far end of a car park. The car park cannot accommodate the patrons that use our hall in as much that it, it, there's not enough capacity. So, just sat here thinking just now that if there are an incident, we did have to vacate the hall, then cars are going to be filling that car park and our assembly point is going to be restricted. So should we be looking at doing something differently? Um, I suppose you'd be looking at perhaps having a, a plan B. And because life being what it is, if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong when it's dark. And the car park is going to be absolutely crammed full. Um, 
So you can have, perhaps have a plan B. Our concern is getting people safely out of the building. And once they're out, yes, they're safe from fire. Uh, we still want them in, a, ideally, one area. Um, you say the car park's uh, no use. Um, I don't know what other areas are around. Um, lining up along the pavement, is there a field nearby or anything like that, or any other areas? We only have a field which I can talk or we can talk to the local farmer, maybe have a gate installed with his permission that we can easily access it. And then, yeah, assembly point in the field. Then, yeah, then you've got that plan B, if you like. Yeah. Um, our okay. concern is in, ensuring that people are safely out of the building. But we don't want to get them safely out of the building and they're all stood in the road and they get hit by a, a bus for, what, for whatever. And we obviously do need to protect them. So, yeah, having that plan B, and um, perhaps as a farmer's field, um, you probably find that people probably walk away anyway, but it is having an area there. And if the car park's no good, then perhaps a field or something like that. Thank you. Um, okay, let's move on to the next bit, which is the management of fire safety. Now, the good management of fire safety is essential, ensuring that any fire safety matters that arise are effectively addressed. In your hall, you can have a top of the range fire alarm system. You could have extinguishers all over the place. You could have fire doors here, there and everywhere. If your premises aren't managed correctly, believe me, things will go wrong. So we're looking at uh, the management your fire risk assessment is current, it's up to date. Those things that need doing, those significant findings have been addressed. Your emergency plan, um, we expect it to be up to date and not something that was drawn up when the hall was built or when you first took over the hall 10, 15 years ago. It needs to be current. Uh, we'd expect perhaps a record, there's nothing to say you've got to keep records, but if you do keep records of drills, ad hoc training, etc. It's certainly good practice. And it shows, um, it's your audit trail. It's showing that um, you're doing what needs doing. Um, good management, it's imperative that, um, excuse me just a minute. Close that. So I've had something pop up on my screen, it's totally thrown me. Um, it's imperative that those in control of the premises are familiar with the fire safety procedures in place. We've already talked about um, somebody hiring your hall for a one-off one event. It's important that they know what measures to take to ensure people can get out safely in the event of a fire. Records of testing, emergency lighting, um, extinguishers, etc. Again, you don't need to keep those records, but it's good practice at your audit trail. I'd recommend um, periodic checks of your premises. Now, I'm guessing you're all members who've all got access to this document. As we mentioned at the start, really worthwhile. Um, have a look at it. There's some really interesting bits in there. One bit, for example, is Appendix A, and it's a periodic fire safety checklist it's aimed at village halls and community buildings it's brilliant i've looked through it it covers all aspects of fire safety a periodic checklist which you can go through perhaps once a month once every three months and perhaps date and record when you did that on top of that in that document <clears throat> there's a checklist for hirers um, one of the questions earlier was about um, people using the hall and whatever. There's a checklist here in that uh, publication, checklist for hirers, both before admitting the public. The first thing I'm looking at, exit doors, readily available, unlocked, um, escape routes free from obstruction, um, extinguishers in place. So that's before the event and at the end of the function, a second checklist for hirers, uh, which includes a general look around the premises, checking for smoldering, etc., electrics unplugged, um, turning out lights, a really informative checklist. I recommend 
it would follow that. All comes under that management. Management, I say it's the key bit. I could talk for an hour on a fire that occurred in a residential care home in Scotland in 2004, a few years ago now. That residential care home was purpose built. I had fire doors, it had a relatively new fire alarm system, extinguishers, it was all there. What on earth could go wrong? Because what went wrong was the way the premises were managed. <clears throat> they had a cupboard on an escape route, um, which was kept open. They had fire doors to bedrooms, which were kept wedged open. Staff training was non-existent. Uh, the fire alarm system, although it was recently um, updated, the staff didn't have a clue how to use it. It was a residential care home in Scotland, Rose Park, it was called. And if you Google it, you'll read a bit more about it. It mapped um, particular premises. The management was poor. 14 people died in a fire in that residential care home because of poor management. Right. Believe me, management of fire safety is one of the key bits. All right. Let's move on to specific concerns I've noted during my time visiting village halls. I said I've been in quite a few years, visited quite a few halls in Somerset and sat at the office. Lots of people ring in with different queries, etc., and were here to help. So specific concerns noted during my time, third party use. <clears throat> it's imperative that those that hire your hall are made aware of the fire safety measures in place. They have access to your fire risk assessment and they carry out their own risk assessment to complement yours to address their specific needs. And we talked about play groups with security, etc. Right. Drapes and curtains. I said we'd be talking about this. <clears throat> Drapes and curtains, whether it's stage curtains or whatever, need to be appropriately treated to reduce the spread of fire. They can be treated. They can be treated by yourself or professionally. If Sorry about this. Um, OK, if you're going to treat them yourself, um, it's imperative you follow the uh, instructions, whether it comes in a tin or whatever, in a packet. It's imperative you follow the instructions. Keep the instructions. Keep the receipts. All right. That's your audit trail. You could treat your curtains this week. And uh, <clears throat> yes, you follow the instructions on the tin. Um, you've disposed of the tin, disposed of all the other bits and pieces of paperwork. I'll come along in a month's time or two months time, maybe next year. Have you treated those curtains? Yes, we have. Can you show me any documents to uh, prove that you've treated those uh, curtains? No, we can't. All right, if you do treat them yourself, keep all the documentation. Keep a record of what you've done, dates, etc. <clears throat> that is your audit trail. Personally, I'd recommend if you're going to get your curtains and drapes treated, you go to a reputable dry cleaner. Um, a lot of dry cleaning companies will treat your curtains, they launder and they'll treat. Again, keep the invoice. Right, that is your audit trail. Keep the invoice um, and read the instructions that come with it. It may be that this treatment will only last for a set period. I don't know. It may be after three years they need retreating. It may be that after laundering, again, they'll need retreating. So I recommend dry cleaners. If you want to do it yourself, that's up to you. But I'd recommend a dry cleaner and certainly keep all available documentation because when you're challenged if something goes pear-shaped that is your audit trail <coughs> we need to ensure that they're uh, not dragging the floor 
so just above floor level and they're not obstructing fire exits. And obviously not too close to heaters. Upstairs areas. <clears throat> it may be in your hall, you have an upstairs area, I don't know. If it's used as a store and just a store, it's not so critical. <clears throat> but if it's used for public use, your fire risk assessment will need to be more in depth as the risk is greater. So if you've got an upstairs area that's um, used for members of the public, I would probably expect to see linked smoke detectors. Right? Because somebody's standing downstairs shouting fire, it's not going to go through two fire doors up the stairs and into the door at the top of the stairs. And you're not going to hear it. So we've got an upstairs area, I'd expect uh, linked detection. I'd also expect with upstairs areas that you'd have two staircases, the either ends of the building. Maybe it's just a small room and you would have one. It depends on the risk. But if it's quite a large area, I'd expect doors at either end. And I'd expect those doors to lead to a staircase that is protected from the room downstairs. All right, so what we don't want is something to happen in the room downstairs, straight out into the staircase, up the stairs, obstructing the means of escape. I'd basically expect a fire door going into the room at the bottom of the stairs. So the fire, if it does occur downstairs, it's contained. The detectors will pick it up, raise the alarm, and the people upstairs can safely evacuate the building past the fire door. They mention if it's just used as a storeroom, then it's not so critical. <clears throat> sleeping. We touched on sleeping. If we've got sleeping within your hall, escape group, for example, doing a sleepover, automatic fire detection, smoke detectors, must be provided. And I'd expect it to be checked prior to use and your fire risk assessment reviewed. Storerooms, uh, storerooms within your hall, we'd expect to be kept locked shut. All right, in that storeroom is where we're keeping the foam mats and other things, other things that are going to burn quite easily. So we'd expect them away from the public area and ideally in that locked storeroom. Kitchens, kitchens depends on the, uh, the amount of cooking, basically, if it's if it's more like a commercial kitchen, the risk is greater. So we'd expect the measures in place to be increased. If it's a kitchen where you're going to perhaps make um, cups of tea and slice up some bits of cake, the risk is considerably reduced. So the measures in place are going to be reduced. But kitchens, if you've got um, doors, fire resisting self-closing doors on your kitchen, they're there for a reason and they're there to stop the spread of fire and to protect the escape routes for other people within the building. Likewise, you may have one of these fire resisting shutters that comes down. If it's a new hall, yes, that will be a building regs requirement. Maybe linked to the fire alarm. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you've got a, a shutter that automatically closes when the fire alarm activates, it's pretty imperative to make sure that that area below the shutter is not obstructed. All right, so the shutter is going to come down to counter level. We don't really want, um, I don't know, a cake, a pile of plates or whatever obstructing that area when it drops down. Likewise, um, kitchens, um, your kitchen may have a door that leads directly to the outside, we would not expect that door to be used as a fire exit for members of the public. For the simple reason, a kitchen is a high risk area and we wanna keep members of the public away from high risk areas. And you should have sufficient exits to enable the, the uh, occupants to escape safely from the building without using any door through a kitchen. <clears throat> Another question I quite often get asked, do we need a plan? Yes, I'd recommend 
a plan of your hall on display. Perhaps near the fire information, you know, the address and how to call the fire service, etc. Um, that plan can be just a rough single line drawing showing the escape routes, the escape doors, positioning of um, extinguishers, perhaps location of electric mains, water cutoff maybe, that sort of thing. That sort of information, it will help other hall users. Talking about plans, seating plans. If your hall is used for, um, <clears throat> I don't know, events, uh, movies, etc., etc., then perhaps it's a good practice to have a seating plan available. Uh, seating, we'd expect gangways and exits to be kept clear of at least 1.05 metres. And seats fixed together. Uh, we expect them to be uh, fixed together. And the number of seats in a row so positioned that you don't have to walk past more than seven seats to get to the, uh, the corridor or the walkway. So if the seats are tight up against the wall, uh, a maximum of seven seats in that row. If it's a massive hall and you've got walkways either end of the rows of seats, then you can actually have 14 seats in a row because you can go either way. And uh, there's a maximum number of seven seats that you have to pass. There's also guidance on the maximum number of meters that you have to travel to get to the exit door. It's detailed in here. We won't go too deep into that today. But certainly seating plans, rough seating plans, have them available. Oh, this next one's a good one. Let's have a quick sit. Hang on. <clears throat> How many people can I have in my hall? Mm. At one time, we used to um, calculate it for you. Right? Certainly in Somerset, we'd calculate it. We work with licensing and we say, right, this is the maximum number of people permitted in this hall. When the legislation changed, we went to a risk assessment, risk based approach. It put the onus on your shoulders. Right? Guidance is available. Um, you may get direction from licensing, but you wouldn't get direction from us. We wouldn't say, yes, you can safely have um, X number of people in your hall. So how do we work it out? <clears throat> we work on the assumption, sorry, that we want to get the people out of your hall in two and a half minutes. Right. If it's higher risk, that time is reduced. If it's a lower risk, that time is increased will work on a two and a half minute escape time, evacuation time. So we look at the size of the building and we look at the available floor space. Um, so we've worked out the available uh, floor space in square meters. We then look at what's being used or what the hall's being used for. If it's dancing, um, on average, half a square meter per person. So if you've got a hall and you've got 100 square meters of available floor space, uh, available, so that excludes the disco area or any other areas, 100 square meters of available uh, floor space, if it's just used for dancing, 200 people. If it's used for people sat at tables, it's one square meter per person. All right. Again, this is guidance, right? It's all guidance. If it's people stood at a bar, it's 0.3 square meters per person. So you look at your available floor space. Sorry? So was there a question there? No, okay. So you look at the available floor space and then look at the uh, what we call the um, occupancy rating so you can calculate roughly how many people at hall can theoretically hold. The next thing we've got to do is ensure that those people can get out safely. Basically, we're looking at doors either end of the hall. 
if it's a re really small hole and it's got one door at the front and it's an inward opening door, the maximum number of people permitted in that hole, no matter how big it is, will be 60. Right, if it's a single inward opening door, 60 people. So if you've got a room upstairs and uh, it's a single inward opening door and it's a relatively small room, it'll be 60. Right. Guessing that's not the, not the case with your hall. So we're looking at doors either end. <clears throat> now this is rough ballpark figures. If it's a single outward opening door, that will cater for 100 people. If it's a double outward opening door, that will cater for 200 people. Right. That is a real ballpark figure. If the doors are slightly bigger, there's a formula where you can work out the exact number of people. That's a real ballpark figure. So, for example, um, your hall, if you've got the front doors, which actually open outwards to the outside, you've got a set of doors at the back, which open outwards, double set of doors. And you've got a double set of doors on the side, which open outwards. You're thinking, hey, yeah, I can get 600 people in my hall. It doesn't quite work like that. Because once we've worked out how many doors we've got, how many people can safely get out through those doors, we then assume, well, we've got a fire somewhere, haven't we? We'll assume that the fire is by the largest set of doors. And we'll take those doors out of the equation. So let's say, for example, you've got um, massive um, six foot wide double opening doors, then the far end of the hall and the other uh, along the side and front double opening doors. We'll take away the largest set of doors at the far end and you can safely get 400 people out your building. If you've got one set of doors down one end and one set at the front, we'll take out one set of doors and you can safely have 200 people in your hall. Did that complicate matters or was that not too bad? There's more support and guidance um, in the document, in the guidance document. Um, it's all in there. It's just knowing which page it's on. But you're looking at uh, the size of the hall and calculating how many people theoretically can be in the hall. And then we're looking at the doors. We'll take away the biggest set of doors and then we'll work out how many people can safely escape from the doors that are left. And double opening outwards, 200. Single outward opening, 100. If it's an inward opening door uh, in a single room, you're looking at 60. And on larger halls, we don't accept inward opening doors. Oh, yes. So that answers my question, doesn't it, Roy? Because what you're saying is that if we've got one set of doors which are double doors, and we've yeah, yeah. got three other sets which are single doors, it would, for the calculation, you'd use the three single doors, that would be 300 capacity. Yes, you would. Yeah, you'd take the double doors out of the equation. The only other caveat with that is that we expect those doors to be evenly spread around the hall. So if we had, for example, not that you would, but um, a double set of doors and a single outward opening door, um, then the far end of the hall, and they're relatively close together, then a fire in that area would take out both sets of doors. So it's working on the assumption that the doors are strategically placed around the hall. Talk about the layout of the hall during events. Now I'd suggest that uh, the biggest risk to fire when you're laying out a hall, for example, a disco, that risk is placed furthest away from the main exit doors. Well, that's your biggest risk. If a fire is going to happen, there's a pretty good chance that's where it's going to be. You need it furthest away from the exit doors. And more importantly, the main exit doors. 
Because don't ask me why in a fire situation, if somebody has gone in through the front door of your hall and you told them to get out, no matter where they stood, they'll try and get out the door that they entered the building. All right. Just the way we've probably all been saying, well, I'd, I'd be different because I've read out and seen studies on it, but um, the majority of people will try and exit the building from the same door that they entered. So keep that biggest risk, the disco or whatever, furthest away from the main exit. <clears throat> oh, another question. Why does my emergency lighting stay on? The well, emergency lighting, as we mentioned, is designed to come on when there's a mains failure, <clears throat> and it'll come on for one to three hours. In a cinema situation, and possibly nightclubs and things like that, emergency lighting will stay on 24-7 when the premises are occupied. Right. If in your hall you show films, then we'd expect your emergency lighting to stay on. So the reason your emergency lighting stays on, if it does stay on, is probably because you show films and during those events, it needs to remain on. Well, next question we've had, let's have another quick sip, I'm gonna hang on. <clears throat> well, we have problems with break glass call points being damaged. So in this particular hall, Yes, he had break glass call points to raise the alarm in the event of fire. And during certain events, probably 18th birthday parties and the like, um, the break glass call points were being damaged. Covers are available. Well, you can have lift up covers for those break glass call points. So rather than just walk by and knock it, you've actually got to lift the cover up and then press. All right. It, it reduces that sort of impulse um, aggression, if you like, of hitting the, uh, the break glass call point. Um, likewise with fire extinguishers and certain types of events, um, extinguishers being set off are a problem. Certainly nightclubs, bars, etc. And if you go some pubs you go into, you won't see the extinguishers. Right. Um, because they are a problem with certain individuals. We've had a few beers on board. Um, they'll set them off or whatever. So if that's the case, um, fire extinguishers, we can accept them being concealed, um, perhaps put out the way of public access behind the bar, maybe behind a curtain. All right. We can accept that if it's covered in the risk assessment and you've justified why you've done it and staff are aware of where those extinguishers are and also that um, signage is provided. All right, so if you're having real problems with extinguishers, you've got some extinguishers by the exit doors and they're continually being set off or whatever. Yes, we can accept them being um, concealed from members of the public, provided that the people that need to know where they are do know where they are and there's signage available. It needs to be covered in your risk assessment. Extinguishers, how many extinguishers do I need? <clears throat> Fire extinguishers are a very, very competitive market. I'd recommend to you that um, if you're renewing your contract, you get two or three quotes and go from there. All right. If you have an ongoing contract, then uh, your extinguisher company will come along once a year and check the extinguishers for you. <clears throat> um, if you're going to be there and perhaps uh, we've got some other committee members there present, um, ask the extinguisher maintenance man if he's going to set them off. Can you have a play? Sometimes they will oblige. All right, this is a water extinguisher. So rather than him take it there and just set it off in a drain, which they do sometimes, because um, they're setting them off three or four times a day, um, maybe they'll let you have a play, for want of a better word, get experience of using those extinguishers. 
a real competitive market, get quotes. How many do you need? We well, need one fire extinguisher every 200 square meters with a minimum of two. So let's say, for example, your hall is 150 square meters. You need two extinguishers minimum. You would expect them to be positioned by exit doors. So we'd expect a minimum of two extinguishers plus additional risks. So in a kitchen, a fire blanket, maybe if you've got like a computer suite type place, maybe a carbon dioxide, that sort of thing. All right. But do get quotes. I've been in the village halls where there was extinguishers in every room and the extinguisher salesman really used the scare factor and they had far more extinguishers than they needed. I couldn't lock them if they wanted extinguishers in every room and in every corner of the room. That's up to them. But um, I certainly advise that they get other quotes. End of the day, you're paying them, so uh, they'll oblige. Extinguishers, as we mentioned, checked annually and usually on a rolling contract. Arson. Arson is an issue especially in larger towns. We can reduce arson in your village hall by keeping bins, wheelie bins, etc., away from the main building, ideally in locked compounds. Right. And, and whilst we're on that arson and wheelie bins, uh, not necessarily arson, but uh, discarded cigarettes outside do cause problems. Um, yes, provide cigarette bins or containers for the uh, stubs, etc. Please ensure that the smoking area is well away from wheelie bins. Because, yes, this odd cigarette end will be discarded into that wheelie bin accidentally, possibly. That will smother three or four hours and middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning or whatever, we could have a considerable fire on our hands. So cigarettes, yes, people do smoke outside now. Keep the smoking area well, well away from wheelie bins. I say ideally keep them in locked compounds. Well, that's the end of that session. Um, any questions up to now? Um, yes, please, Roy. Yeah. On a private function, so you've got a private hire of a hall, whether it's ours or wherever, and they decide to, because they've hired it, say, for a big party or a dance or whatever. So if our plan of numbers in the hall, we'll say, is 150, but they choose to in invite 200 guests, well, over to you. I've just, I've just asked, asked that as a question. I mean, it, it, what do we do? How do we police it? Because right, that's our no. problem. Should it be police is what I'm saying. And yes, to a certain extent, but then there's a limit to what you can do. And the people taking on the lease of the hall have got a responsibility. Uh, we talked earlier about um, leasing agreements, if you like. Um, this is all our, our hall. Uh, you're going to hire it for a party. These are lease agreements, which you will adhere to. Maybe they sign to say they're going to adhere to those agreements. And on those agreements, I'd have maximum number permissible are 150 people, for example. Um, so basically, the people that are hiring the hall, yes, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm no solicitor, um, they've got a duty to ensure that people are safe. And uh, the onus is on them. So you're basically covering your back by um, with your lease agreement, which I'd hopefully you'd get them to sign. Thank you. Uh, I've got uh, Diana. Sorry, going back to curtains, can you put curtains in front of fire doors? Um, oh, good question. And this is recorded, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, of course they'd be treated. <laughs> 
Let me treat curtains on fire doors. The, the problem is obstructing the means of escape. Um, I would say no. But Doing then it blinds, depends. Maybe? Again, blinds, if you've got blinds, you've got to get those blinds, you've got to pull the blinds up to escape, haven't you? No, I mean, if they were just fitted to the glass panels, maybe? If they're fitted onto the doors, yes. and then you can get blinds fitted onto the doors, can't you? Yes. Um, that, that's not a problem. Because I'm thinking, you know, our hall gets plunged into darkness, you know, which doesn't help, does it? When uh, they have pantomimes and things, and then the, mm -hmm. there are long mm -hmm. curtains in front of the glass doors. And that is the means of escape. So, so, yeah, if they want to cover the doors, then they can put black paper over the glass or whatever. Yeah, they need to I, go, I don't live, they? I could live with that, but actually curtains over the doors, and they're probably yeah. obscuring the exit signs as well, the push bar signs, then... No, and especially for a pantomime, because it's going to be quite busy, isn't it? Yeah, that's got to go, isn't it? Yeah, Curtains I would say so. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm all for that. And the other question, <laughs> God, raised seat, is the guidance on the evacuation for raised seating? And there is. I don't know what it is offhand, but there's going to be um, guidance. You've got raised seating in your hall, have you? Well, we have temporary, it's actual proper bona fide, you know, really lovely raised seating that gets put up for the pantomime. <clears throat> it yeah, has so, uh, plenty of corridors going up through. And I think it probably has been assessed properly, but that was before my time. And um, so I'm just interested. Really. So with the raised seating, um, I'm not thinking they're looking at a football stadium or anything like that. I'm guessing there's probably half a dozen rows. Um, oh, probably maybe 12 rows for 12 half, rows. probably half of the hall. So there's some flat seating and then there's some raised seating. So when that raised seating is put up, is it obscuring fire exits? It obscures, fire exits it, obs it obscures one fire exit. And I know that was apparently taken into account. There's still four others there's still three other double doors. Yeah, yeah. So we can get the people out safely. We there can get a, people out. There is another factor which comes into the equation, which is travel distance. Yes. And there's a maximum distance in a single direction that Dirley can travel if it's seating. And let me have a quick look. I've got it written down somewhere. Rather than do, do, do. 18 metres if it's a single direction. 18 metres maximum. So, OK, so, that's great. I expect that's why it's only a certain length then, so that that's 18 metres. Mind you, then you've got to go left or right, haven't you? Yeah, so I assume we're sat in the far corner, the back yeah. seat. One aisle way down through the middle? No, I think it's one each side from memory. So it's one each side. I so, think so. Um, maximum number of seats is going to be 14, 14 in a row. 14, yeah. Yeah. So we can come down. So you're sat in the middle seat. So the distance from the middle seat at the back. Yeah. Along the back wall, down the steps to the exit is going to be 18 meters. Perfect. I can do that. And that um, is that is a guide. Yeah. Um, once you get to the bottom of the steps and if you can go in two directions, then theoretically you can increase that distance. But if we work on 18 meters. Yes, and I mean, I do say to the people that book the tickets, you really ought to ask on mobility and things like that, because the last thing... Yeah, that's other things to consider. Somebody up the top that can't walk very well down to the bottom. So, OK, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. Uh, Doreen? Hi, Roy. Um, we have quite a large hall with three lettable rooms or halls. Um, we've got a good number of exits, all quite obvious. However, a few of them at the moment have got external steps, meaning that they're not ideal for somebody, you know, with mobility issues. We're planning to make them level in the next year or so. And currently we instruct hirers that they need to ensure guests know how to safely leave the building, but we don't specifically highlight the issue of mobility or disability um, and the need for different advice mm -hmm. so how would you recommend that we deal with this mm. <clears throat> 
again, so you've got, you've got three separate rooms and they've each got their own exit to go into outside? Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. So it's going to go onto a platform. You say there's but steps. But, but they're going out onto steps, um, a platform and a step in at least two instances. Yeah. So if the people are hiring the hall, personally, and again, it's over to you how you approach it, but personally, I <laughs> make the hirers aware of those exit issues. And if they do have um, individuals that need flat access, you say you've got one room that can be used, it's got a flat exit? Yes. No steps. So perhaps suggest that they use that particular room. Um, I know you talked about... Um, Quite difficult. Room. They're different size rooms, you know, for different yeah. needs. And so if it's possible to do it that way, or if they're going to use one of the bigger rooms with steps, and there's only a couple steps, make them aware, and they'll need to put measures in place to assist those people down the steps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So again, it's, it's putting the onus onto the hirer to put the measures in place. Yes, I understand. Thank you. And if you're thinking of putting a slope in at a later date, um, there is guidance on the steepness of the slope, if you like. Yes. So, that's, But then any slope is going to be better than the steps, isn't it? But um, there is guidance on the steepness of the slope. Yes. That's great. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. Pleasure. Um, Edwina. Thank you, Roy. Um, I had two questions, but the first one's been answered on the uh, curtains across the fire doors. But our fire doors have... Um, blackout curtains that are actually fixed to the door so when the door opens the curtain the, the blackout goes with them so yeah I assume that's okay that's good yeah the other one is slightly off track it's about our fire alarm control panel uh which apparently needs needs changing at some stage but um our last go-to electrician had a notice up by it informing everybody if the fire alarm went off by accident how to switch it off etc um, but our current go-to electrician says he's not keen on the general public being allowed to fiddle with the fire alarm control box. Um, should we still have some sort of guidance or not? And <clears throat> yes, and the fire alarm control box shouldn't be available to put it bluntly, every man is dog. Only Pacific people should have access to that control box. And mm -hmm. um, that's quite imperative because if you've got the, the alarm goes off, and an individual thinks, oh, I know how to set it, I'll reset it. Who, to, who are they to know that perhaps there's not a fire smoking away in a storeroom? She hasn't yes. checked it. So access to the fire alarm panel, Pacific people only. Right. OK, thank you. Yes, I, I mean, I don't fancy people ring me up at one o'clock in the morning as they're leaving after tidying up. Um, but the electrician is happy to have his name there as well, so that they would have to ring us, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. OK, and thank you. Yeah. And if it's a reg if it's a regular hall hirer, then maybe you want to pass that information to them. Right. But we, yes. We certainly don't want everybody having access to that panel. No. Right. That's OK. Thank you very much. That's, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jill? You're on mute. We occasionally have what we call sails across the ceiling. Um, we have tested them to see if they catch light. They just smolder. Do they still need treatment? Yeah. Ah, <clears throat> good question. Drapes and things like that. And I could tell you a story um, and you'd probably take them all down. Um, if you've got drapes and things hanging from ceilings, yes, they do need to be treated. They're above head height. Yeah, and still <laughs> probably more important really. If you had a small fire in the hall, hot air rises, mm -hmm. and the fact, yes, they're above head height, um, as soon as the heat gets to those drapes and the temperature gets right, the circumstances are right, those drapes, if they're not treated, will basically flash over the entire hall. Right. That's what we were frightened of. <laughs> if, you want me to, if you want me to scare you, uh, um, Google, how uh, was it, a station fire. It's called the station fire. And there's a nightclub in America where they had, it was actually polystyrene, they had a lot of polystyrene in there. And um, 
had a fire and the fire flashed across the ceilings, across the walls, etc. 50 people plus died in that fire. So <laughs> if you want the scare factor, thank you. Google, thank you. <laughs> but they need to be treated. Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, Roy, two questions. Sorry. Moving towards Christmas yeah. then. Christmas decorations get put up in halls, including ours. Should those decorations be carefully purchased to be fireproof? Carefully purchased and managed. Yeah. And um, yes, it's Christmas. Um, we're going to put a few decorations up. Um, yes, it does need to be managed. Um, ideally, if you're buying them, um, fire retardant treated. Ideally. Um, and obviously not too many um, trimmings, etc. So in answer to your question, yes, I'd say they need to be treated. Okay. And second and question, man. sorry, second question, thinking of pantomimes, lady mentioned earlier, drama groups, etc. you said uh, the uh, fire escape lights need to be illuminated if you're having a cinema situation, showing a film. What about in the auditorium, as in you've got a pantomime going on, should those lights still then be illuminated? Oh, Again, I would say yes. Again, I know this is recording or whatever, putting your head on the block, Lord. Um, <clears throat> I would say it's down to your own risk assessment. If there's no lighting in a film, it's really, really dark, isn't it? And there is, yes. In a pantomime, you've got quite a bit of light around. Um, it's going to be down to your risk assessment, which is my little get out on that one. Okay. Thank you. So if it went if it went either way, lights on, lights not on, not maintained. Um, as long as you can justify it in your risk assessment, then uh, I could go with that. Right. Thank you. But the background light in a film is totally slightly different to a pantomime. In a pantomime, you've got a bit more stage lighting and you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's just about modifying um, recommendations for fire doors being open or closed, given the COVID risk currently. Um, we advise everyone to have all the doors open and all the windows open when um, having exercise classes or meetings. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's been, you know, if that's acceptable as far as fire risk goes. Okie dokie. And it's a good question, actually. Um, <clears throat> as a problem we've had especially with care homes and things like that we've done a lot of work with care homes during covid um in your environment um okay so it's a fire door and what's it separating is it protecting an escape route is it on a kitchen or is it just a door that's a solid door that happens to be a fire door we've <laughs> we've got double doors at the front which we pin open and then two um single fire door at the far end of the hall and yeah. the kitchen door to make sure we've got a good flow of air through the um, building when people are doing activities in there. <coughs> so the, door, the doors the at the front and the back, if they're held open, that's not a problem. Although they're called fire doors, um, in fire brigade speak, we've got fire exit doors, which are doors, they can be any type of door, which open to let us get out of the building safely. And then we've got fire doors, which we call fire resisting self closing doors, which are there to protect an escape route. So your fire exit doors at the front and the back of the building, if they're wedged open, no problem. Okay. It makes our life easier. If it's a kitchen door and the kitchen is in use, then that door needs to be kept closed. If for some reason you need it to be held open and you've got um, an automatic fire alarm system fitted, Mm. There are devices that you can fit to the door to hold it open. Okay. Um, if you've got an automatic fire alarm system, you can have it wired into the system. It's going to be pretty expensive and it holds the door open on a magnet. The alarm goes off, magnet releases. Mm. Or places like screw fix, um, you can buy a thing called a door guard. And again, that's another trade name. Probably other devices available. Um, it's a little box which screws to the bottom of the door, battery mm. operated and a pin sticks down into the floor. Um, when the alarm activates, so it's sound activated, the hoover was set it off, the pin releases, the door shuts. 
Okay. So there are devices available, but um, if it's a kitchen door and the kitchen's in use, it must be kept closed. OK, the kitchen's not in use at the moment, but we could use the, the door guards for the internal kitchen door and the internal swing doors to that area. Yeah. OK, lovely. Thank you. Anybody else? More. OK, I've got a couple more things before we finish up. And I appreciate looking at the time, although I've got all day. Time means nothing to me. It really annoys the wife, but there we are. Um, let's move on to our inspection policy. I mentioned at one time, yes, we'd come round to village halls and we'd inspect. That's changed. We now have a risk based inspection program. Um, at the top of that list, as you well imagine, would be sleeping premises residential care homes and hotels and things like that. They're near the top of the list. That's the places we want to inspect. That's the places where if fire is going to happen, there's a bigger chance of somebody losing their lives. So sleeping premises along with complex buildings are at the top of our risk-based inspection program. Um, your hall is probably not at the top of that list. Right? I'll be honest. Not saying you won't get a visit, but um, it's not a guaranteed visit as if you were at the top of the list. So we may visit your premises if we get a complaint from another public or another agency. So let's say, for example, licensing come round to your premises and they found one or two things that are a bit scary. Then uh, they talk to us. We talk to them. We take that information on board and we may visit. Um, like I say, we get a complaint from the member of the public, we may visit. Also, we talked about our risk-based inspection program. We do take and sample some premises lower down the list. You might be one of the lucky ones. Or unlucky ones, depends which way you look at it. I like to think you're one of the lucky ones if we do come along. We will not visit your premises by request. <clears throat> We do get people ring up. Can you come and visit our premises, please, and check it? I'll be honest, that's normally the premises we don't want to go to. We want to go to those premises that don't want us in there. And there are a few out there. That's the ones we want to go to. All right. But that said, we will not visit by request and we will not do your risk assessment for you. We'll help you provide support, which is ideally what this day is about but we will not do your risk assessment for you. And if we come along, um, we talked about um, in my earlier days in my career, I used to do enforcement work, prohibition work, that sort of thing, prosecution. Um, if it's in the public interest, we will consider prosecution. All right. I'm not saying we're going to visit and prosecute a village hall. Let's take the next step. We'll talk about sleeping risks. If we were going to go to a hotel and there was no fire alarm system, there was people sleeping there, whatever, um, we would probably prohibit the use of that building for sleeping and we may prosecute because they've put the public at risk. That said, if you had a escape group sleeping in your hall and um, something happened, maybe seriously injured or something like that, they had a fire, they were seriously injured, and there was no detection or nothing, then we're looking at getting the stick out, the big stick. All right. You have got a duty to protect, and if it's in the public interest, we will take appropriate action. Um, if we do visit your premises, um, we'll have a look round. We won't inspect all areas. All right. We will check, and I'm reading this off a list, we will check that you've done a fire risk assessment, we will check the warning you have in place in case of fire. If it's a shout, if it's a bell, if it's a whistle. We will check that escape routes are available. And those escape routes, especially the ones at the back, lead all the way around to the front of the building. All right. Make sure they're not overgrown with brambles and things, which has been seen before. We'll check fire doors are in good repair. And that's the fire doors inside the building protecting escape routes. We'll check signage. We'll check uh, your procedures on ensuring people can get out safely, especially those that are more vulnerable. We'll check housekeeping. Not if you've been dusting or hoovering. Housekeeping in fire brigade speak is um, 
cardboard boxes and other items obstructing fire escape routes. We will look at your policy on controlling maximum numbers, emergency lighting, emergency plan, uh, staff training, the testing and maintenance regimes, and the appropriate extinguishers. That's the things we look for when we come around. So we're nearly there. Supporting information. Lots and lots of supporting information available free of charge on the big wide web. Today's presentation is based primarily on this document. We will send you, we, that's a royal we, Martin will send you a link to this document. Looks a bit scary at first, 150 odd pages. Um, the first part goes through the risk assessment process, which is going to help you. The second part is a little more in depth. How many people can you have in your hall? It's in here. Travel distances is in here. How many extinguishers do you need? It's in here in part two. It's all in here. It's just knowing what page it's on. This document uh, from your organization is also really, really informative. If you haven't got it, I'm sure Martin will send you the links or whatever. Um, have a look at it. Like the other document, I won't say don't go reading it cover to cover, especially this one. You read this cover to cover, you'll be falling asleep, but use it as a reference. All right, use it as a reference. And so we've got those documents, we're going to forward them to you. Um, I'll also forward you links to um, a central government website where there's lots of support and help. Uh, our website has lots of additional information which will help you. Um, we also have a help desk. Um, Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service have set up a help desk whereby businesses and people like yourself, if you have a problem, uh, you can contact us. It's open nine till five or there's an email uh, address where you can drop us an email over a weekend or whatever, and we'll get back to you. All right, the contact details for that help desk will be sent to you by Martin. Um, almost there. Thank you for your time. I hope you found this really informative and helpful. Um, I say lots of supporting help there if you need it. If you do need a specific question to me, uh, get in touch through Martin and we can sort that or I can point you in the right direction. Um, and one last thing, uh, Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service. Um, yeah, we've got a duty to provide a fire and rescue service. We've got a duty to consult with members of the public as to how we run that service. And we review that every ooh, three or four years, something like that. Um, that process has been reviewed next April. All right. It's what we call a community risk management plan. Lots of information on our website about it. Um, you may get an email from Martin. We haven't got your contact details, but you may get an email from Martin inviting you to join the consultation process to give us your views on the fire service in your area. All right. If you don't get that invite, then please log onto our website and the links will be there. But we'd really appreciate your views and we'd welcome your views on how you think we operate and what you think we should be doing, perhaps what you think we shouldn't be doing. Right, we'd welcome your views on that. And that will get programmed in to our next management plan as to how we operate for the next three or four years. That's it from me, it's finished. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Rob. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a colleague of Roy's. Uh, just um, just <coughs> wanted to say, uh, as Roy mentioned on our website, there's lots of information um, on the Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service uh, website. There are some uh, pro formas, some blank pro formas for risk assessments, and also some examples of risk assessments that are filled in which is quite a good thing because it gives you a little bit of a, an idea and a heads up of, of what direction you're going in. And back to what Roy mentioned earlier, uh, which was that you can, if you feel it's a bit daunting and your village hall is maybe slightly larger than some, so two stories, for example, get the, the, the help and assistance uh, of a professional fire risk assessor, but you don't have to use them every year. You can use that as a one-off and you can use that document yourself then 
to to just uh, continually check year after year. So you don't have to pay a fire risk assessor every year for your fire risk assessment. You can get you can get him to do it the first time, and then you can use that document and build on it if necessary, alter it if necessary. So I just wanted to say that, Roy. That was all. Yeah, thanks for that, Rob. That's really appreciated. And Rob's joined us today. Uh, yes, we work pretty closely together. Um, any future presentations, Rob will probably be doing because um, early in the next year, I'm actually finishing and Rob's taking over talks, etc. So uh, hopefully today he's picked up some tips on what to do and what not to do. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Okay, right. Well, I hope you found this morning useful. Um, thank you very much, Roy, for you know, the time, the effort you've put in. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's very revealing how you sort of treat each question like an onion skin and start to peel back and sort of get behind it and find out years of experience going on. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I will be very surprised if you know anybody. Well, doesn't go away from today thinking I need to talk to the committee about this or I need to check this out. So I think you're all going to be pretty busy. Um, I'm very happy to sort of coordinate um, things. Uh, uh, so rather than everybody trying to sort of pester Roy, I can sort of sift it and, and then go back and, and get some more information from him. Um, yeah, the, the document he's referred to um, and the other contact details, I'll email those out um, hopefully later on today. In about an hour's time, I'm jumping on a train up to Leicester to the National Village Halls um, gathering. So uh, I'll, I'll try and do it. Well, I've cracked the hotel's IT system this evening. Um, and the, the ACRE document, normally that's um, available only to Devon Community Together's members. Um, but what I'll do this time to those of you who aren't members, um, circulate it. It's getting near Christmas, so you can have it as a Christmas present. But hopefully um, you will see the value of, of events like this and uh, you'll know, find sort of ongoing membership uh, something to your advantage. So, yeah, thanks very much for today, Roy. It's been really useful. Um, you know, you can tell by the questions that are asked. It is something that, that you know, do, people do worry about and have concerns about. And, um, you know, you, you found one or two things. I will add my final story. You, talk, you talked about fire extinguishers being oversold. Um, I was at a hall in North Devon where they had three containers, each with three different types of fire extinguisher in with nice examples of how to use them, illustrations of what sort of fires to use them on. There was one CO2 fire extinguisher missing and I pointed that out and I said, where is it? He said, oh, it's up behind the stage. I said, well, why? He said, well, we use it during the panto to create a fog. <laughs> <laughs> and that's you know that, that's a, a, a typical you know of village halls you know innovate but you know hang the safety you know <laughs> anyway thank you all for your attendance um yeah as i said it, this will go up on our website so you can share it with your colleagues and um i hope you found it all useful and, and thank you very much roy for the, the time you've put in today thank you that's right you're thank welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.